let's look at where we're at. Um, you know, when you talk about conventional agriculture, people think conventional is how it's always been. It's not how it's always been. Uh, it's 10 decades of what I call the chemical experiment, where we started treating symptoms with, with chemicals. And it wasn't how we did it for tens of thousands of years before, but is that model sustainable? Because we've had 10 decades of, of treating problems with the chemical solution. Uh, and basically, what you need to know is that last year we increased chemicals, this is globally, by 14.7%. The year before that, 14.4%. The year before that, 14.1%, 13.9%, 13.6%, 13.1%. Uh, every single year, for 10 decades, more and more chemicals globally poured into our environment, but wait for it, every year, without exception, more and more pest and disease pressure globally. So that's literally the definition of unsustainable, putting more and more on for less and less response is obviously not a good model. Uh, and that more and more, of course, is costing you more and more. So a big part of this, uh, what we're going to teach today is this, how you can get back to root causes rather than treating symptoms. We talk about the concept of treating symptoms, I mean, let's look at human health, and I can't, I have to do that, reverting back to human health because this whole interrelationship. But if we look at the human health model, the largest killer on the planet last year was, was coronary heart disease, followed very, very closely by cancer, which will probably take over by Christmas this year. Uh, number three for a long time has been stroke. Number three has just been re relegated to number four. Guess what number three is? Prescription medicine is our third largest killer on the planet. If you look at the average American, at 60, they're on 16 medications, and by 65, it's 22 average medications. And the whole model is that everything shuts something down. It's how something moves. The world's largest selling chemical you know, drug is the lipid-lowering drugs, the cholesterol-lowering drugs. And their mode of action, as is the case with almost every example, except things like antibiotics, which kill good and bad. Um, but the, the model is that you shut something down. Well, the, body, the human body is this marvel, and it never does one thing. Like if you look at the, how they all work, the nine drugs that lower cholesterol, uh, they shut down the building block of cholesterol. The first fatal flaw there is that cholesterol is not a poison. Cholesterol is a hugely important nutrient. It's an antioxidant. Uh, really importantly, you've got a thing called your hormone cascade and the building block at the top of it, this is the building block for key things like progesterone, estrogen, of course, testosterone and so forth. Uh, at the top of that is cholesterol. It's the building block. For that. And so people on that drug lose libido after 12 months. It's a really common side effect. That's because you're not building testosterone. And testosterone is not just about libido. This is the, how, the interrelationship. Testosterone is about muscle integrity. And you see you're 50 and you look in the mirror after hopping out of the shower and you've got this little bit of sagging flesh under your arms perhaps and you think, what the hell, I'm doing the same exercise, eating the same food I've always done. Uh, and what you're looking at is a very common scenario of testosterone decline for a variety of reasons, including the building blocks for testosterone, which include things like omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, but what you're looking at it's quite a serious thing because you've got one muscle, because this is muscle integrity, the most important role of testosterone. You've got one muscle that's going boomph, boomph, boomph. That if you've got sag here, you've got sag there. And that's not a good picture when uh, testosterone is so strongly linked to heart health and this whole largest killer current. So you're taking something for your heart and it's affecting one of the most important nutrients for heart health. And that's the bankruptcy of a symptom treating model. If we look at veterinary science, we know that dogs in 1900 lived on average till 18. We know the genetic potential of dogs, perhaps not some of the crossbred, the new hybrid poodles, but the genetic potential for dogs is 22 because dogs have lived that long. Uh, 18 was the average. Last year, the average was eight years. So how can you, as a veterinary scientist, I took them down from 18 to eight, I did a good, it's kind of pathetic. 
indictment of the bankruptcy of a symptom treating approach. And as I mentioned, in the agricultural model, we've done the same thing, more and more chemicals. It, you know, the whole thing started with a guy called Justice von Liebig, German chemist, leading chemist of his time, industrial chemist, but a chemist. Um, and he took some plant matter, 100 kilos. If you take 100 kilos of your crop and burn it, you've got five kilos, and that's the ash that contains the minerals that grew that crop. Uh, and so he took some plant matter, burned it, analysed the ash with the crude technology that was present at that time and determined that that ash largely consisted of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. And he said, well, geez, we can make this stuff. We've got armaments, factories lying dormant across the globe at that point. We can put the stuff in a bag. And so began the dumbing down. I mean, understand that the first cell that oozed from the pre-Cambrian motion had 74 minerals. And if you recognise this perfect blueprint, this marvel, interrelated marvel called nature, you realise there are no accidents of the 74 minerals. There's a role for it for 74 minerals. And the conventional, when I say conventional, the original way of farming, where animals were always part of that equation and where you spell paddocks and you had green manure crops and you recycled the animal manure, uh, at least, you, you know, every time you take a crop off, you're removing a little bit of those 74 minerals, but you were recycling them in the original model. And now we just said, well, we don't need to do any of that stuff. I mean, we can just put it on from a bag put three things on, take 74 off. And 10 to 15 years after that, we started to see pest and disease pressure unlike anything anyone had ever seen. And rather than saying, is it linked to this dumbed down nutrition, which of course it was, science stepped up to the block and said, here's a bunch of chemicals that will do the job. And we've put more and more of those things on every year ever since for less and less response. You say, oh, I tried this diethane and it worked. Yeah, it did. But we're talking the global picture we're putting more and more on for less and less response. Now, every society prior to ours, without exception, sometime asked, at some point asks the question, is what, as a guideline to the success of whatever, in this case we're talking food production, but the question is, what is the next generation inheriting as a measure of the success of that society? And when we ask that question, there's very little work. See, there's three things you weren't told about this idea of controlling pests and diseases with chemicals. Uh, the first of those is called bioaccumulation. What happens to those tiny residues that are present? A snow pea has 11 residues on average. A tomato has nine residues. And there are amounts, amounts that we said, yeah, we tested it with a guinea pig and you can get away with four parts per million of diethane and five parts per million of glyphosate. But how does the body actually manage that? Well, your liver, is your most important organ, more important than your heart. It's charged with, with your pancreas to digest and you don't live if you don't digest, but it's also involved in what's called a two-stage detoxification process where your liver removes and detoxes your body. Uh, and basically the model is that half of the chemicals that, well, half of the chemicals we're using are chemicals that are based on nature that we just took an active and, and synthesized it. And the liver can look at that and say, yeah, I can recognize that and can proceed to detox to some degree that contaminant. But half or just under half of those chemicals are our creations. And the liver says, what the hell is that thing? And it recognizes it's not a good chemical structure and it pumps it off and stores it in our fat cells. And that's called bioaccumulation. So when they looked, and there's been very little studies on this, uh, when they looked at 700 children in the US half of them from rural areas, half of them from urban areas to see if there was a difference. And they looked at the 13 most commonly used farm chemicals in a study from four and a half years ago, fungicides, pesticides, herbicides, a wormicide that we most of us pour down the animal's throat. To the horror of the research, they couldn't find one child who didn't have unacceptable levels of all 13 chemicals according to FDA standards. And that is not a pretty picture because the largest killer of our kids is childhood leukemia. We've got a leukemia ward in every city. The first case was only discovered in 1907. And there is no date debates, debates or arguments about the link between environmental chemicals, not just farm chemicals, but all the food stabilizers and dozens. In fact, there are 74,000 registered chemicals out there. Uh, but you know, if we can do it better, then we should be looking at it. And I'm very thankful that you've come to have a look at what other options there are. And that's what we're going to talk about frantically for the next few days. Um, so we mentioned the, the school kids, 1,400 it was, 700 from town, 700 from rural areas and that whole story. Um, huge 
increases in chemicals on a yearly basis. We're talking about what, you know, when I started this journey, and many of us working in this field have noted the same thing, uh, there was just a trickle of an interest, you know, there were lots of folded arms, which is the body language of what the hell's this shit about, uh, uh, and that you try and unfold. And it was, you know, it was very different. There's been kind of a, a wake, uh, an awakening happening globally. Um, I'm touring, for example, Europe in a couple of weeks' time and everything's sold out. Uh, and that awakening is, everyone's noting it. It's happened in the last four or five years and it's wonderful that there's a change on that scale. But some of the things driving that wake up, um, one of them is how important this thin veil of, of topsoil is. There's nothing on the planet that comes close to its importance. We can't feed ourselves without that thin veil. And we're losing that at 7 to 12 tonnes per hectare per year and it's speeding up because of climate change. And at that rate, according to Professor Ritan Lal, probably the world's leading ag scientist, in a whole body of papers that he submitted five years ago, we got that was then, so now it's, it was 60 years left and there's zero at that rate of loss. Uh, well, now it's 55 years and there's no, and you don't live. You say, oh, we could feed ourselves hydroponically. No, you can't. It's crap food. You need to understand hydroponics is crap food. Why is that? Well, we'll teach you later how you can use a little tool called a refractometer. So the story is that there are two forms of nitrogen, nitrate nitrogen and ammonium nitrogen. And ammonium nitrogen sort of dominates in the, in the model because there's nitrogen fixation and there's this whole nitrate ammonia cycle in the soil. But in hydroponics, you use just one form, calcium nitrate and potassium nitrate. It's just the nitrate form. And the nitrate form is always uptaken with water. That, and the plant won't stop. If it's there, it uptakes it and always with water. And that dilutes everything else. So when you're measuring dissolved solids, you're measuring the food value. A lettuce should be 12 degrees bricks on that little meter. A good lettuce, 12 or higher. We've never found a hydroponic lettuce anywhere on the planet higher than one and a half degrees bricks. It's a piece of total unmitigated crap that shouldn't be entering your mouth. Uh, you can't grow good food. You can, there's a whole thing and we, we're helping with that. You can bring microorganisms into that equation. You can add some other extra nutrients, including silica, which of course is never going to be available in a hydroponic solution otherwise. Um, and you can change that, but it's never ever comparable to a good soil. So the, there isn't an option. Soil is precious beyond belief. And you say, well, how do we lose? Uh, how, why are we losing seven to 12 tons of humus on a yearly basis? Well, of soil rather, and that relates to this thing called humus, the glue that holds us all together. We've gone from 5% organic matter globally average down to 1.5% and that's the glue. That's, that's, our rivers run brown. We have dust storms at one point covering the entire eastern seaboard from South, Africa, from South Australia right to Cairns. We had a dust storm a, a decade or so back trillions of tons of topsoil, but dust storms are a loss of the glue that holds that soil. Rivers are not supposed to run, run brown following a rainstorm event, uh, and that's humus, the organic matter, the stuff that holds the soil together and does many, many other things as we'll talk. So it's a huge part of the story. We're going to talk about how we can change that. Uh, and we're also going to talk about this, when we talk about what I call nutrition farming, we're talking about minerals, microorganisms, and humus, this all-important thing called humus, uh, and their interrelationships. And it's all about just understanding how these three things work. And the soil life story has almost got, you say, well, which is more important, minerals or microbes? It's kind of that chicken and egg scenario because they're both hugely important. But the pendulum is very much swinging to the importance of these billions of organisms beneath your feet, that they determine every aspect. And there's this tremendous parallel, every aspect of plant health and plant resilience is determined by these microorganisms. And there's this tremendous parallel with your own system. We've thought of ourselves physically as this sack of cells, basically 10 trillion cells, um, all interrelated, all communicating together on a daily basis. And, and that does, you know, these cells are who we are physically. We've got a whole separate thing called a spirit, but we're physically this 10 trillion cells, uh, 10 billion cells, sorry, not trillion. Um, and then we discover more recently there's been more research on this thing than anything in recent years, but particularly the last decade, this discovery of the importance of the human microbiome. And we realize now we've got a 30 foot tube that runs between our mouth and our anus that contains a hundred trillion, a hundred billion. There's actually 10 times more of them than there is of us. You've got 6 billion per square centimeter on every square centimeter. And you can say, get those filthy things off there. 
and hop into a bath of Dettol morning and night, and you last six days and you die. You kill your protective biofilm. Very much what we've done to, to plants in many instances is this very strong parallel. And when we look at what, these, what this life within gifts us, uh, this whole suite of biochemicals that sort of sustain and protect us, uh, as well as helping with the digestion and so forth, it's exactly the same as what's happening in the external stomach of the plant, which is this, what's called the rhizosphere, this little tiny zone right beside the roots where uh, the plant is feeding 30%. It's a fascinating concept. So you've got the most important process on the planet that's called photosynthesis. And you say, that can't be the most important. Well, it is, because that's where you come from. All carbon-based life forms come from the most important process where plants take water and sunlight and carbon dioxide in these little green sugar factories called chloroplasts, and they make the building block of everything, including you. And that building, that's where it comes from. The building block of all carbon chemistry comes from this process of photosynthesis. Um, so it's, you, you can't get more important than that. But and the plant uses glucose in conjunction with minerals for everything it does, including productivity and production and so forth, and protection. But Half of its glucose that it makes in these little sugar factories every night, it pumps down to its roots. And 60% of that half, it gives away. What the hell would you do that for? Your most important substance, you pump out from your roots. Why would you do that? Because there, at the nexus of the single most important process on the planet, is arguably the most important simple, simple principle. And that principle is, and it's throughout nature, and it's throughout your life and you might not even recognize it. That principle is give and you shall receive. 